Monsters is a show about the worst human beings on the planet. Viewer discretion is advised. If you'd like to support the show, the easiest way is to donate a few bucks at buymeacoffee.com forward slash monsters. There's more information about supporting us in the video's info or at our website, thisismonsters.com forward slash support. Jody Arias was another woman who couldn't handle being broken up with by her boyfriend. When she learned that Travis Alexander was spending time with other women, she made sure to put an end to that, permanently. This is Monsters. I know this case is well known and has been talked about many times before, but my interest in true crime has always been mostly about the psychological aspect of the perpetrators. Jody Arias' case is so complex and so steeped in psychology, but psychologists have had a hard time giving her a real diagnosis. Dr. Dale Archer wrote in Psychology Today that she doesn't have all of the traits to be diagnosed as a sociopath, she doesn't have borderline personality disorder, and she wasn't a battered woman suffering from PTSD, since her claims of abuse by Travis were never corroborated by any evidence. Dr. Archer said she most closely suffers from narcissistic personality disorder, though she doesn't really meet all of the criteria for that either. It seems to be the closest diagnosis that one can give her as Dr. Archer says, quote, Arius craves attention more than she fears death, end quote. There have been some arguments about how to pronounce Arius, and I just wanted to start by playing Jody Arius herself, confirming how she pronounces her name. Your name has been pronounced in most of this trial, Arius. Is there another way of pronouncing it? Have you always pronounced it Arius? I've heard it pronounced about seven different ways. Um, I say Arius, as does the rest of my family. Okay. Friends of Jody Arius described her as a good girl who lived an almost ideal life. Still, she dropped out of high school in the 11th grade. She had developed a love of photography at a young age and continued to pursue photography as a career. She worked a series of dead-end jobs and lived in multiple areas of California before getting a job for prepaid legal, which is now called Legal Shield. This is a work-at-home sales job where you make commission for sales of prepaid legal services. She met Travis Alexander at a prepaid legal conference in Las Vegas in September of 2006. Travis was a motivational speaker and salesman for the same company. Well, good evening. Good evening. You are a cheery bunch. I appreciate you, uh, you being here. Um, by show of hands, uh, who was here a year ago when I, when I spoke? Okay, so about half this, this part of the room, you guys were not. <laughs> All right, so uh, thank you guys for uh, sticking around. Um, I'm, uh, I'm really happy to be here, and matter of fact, the conversation to get me here was about 15 seconds long. Um, I, I lived in Colorado for two years, about 10 years ago, and um, I was just mentioning before the, the training today that out of all the places I've lived, this is by far my favorite place of all, and, and I, I truly do love it here. I love it because of the scenery, I love it because of the people. It's just a special place to be. You guys are very fortunate um, to live here. And when I move again, um, and that may be more sooner than later, it'll be back to Colorado, so maybe, I may be in your midst soon. So Immediately after meeting, the couple began talking on the phone every day, and court records showed that they had exchanged roughly 82,000 emails over the course of their relationship. Travis lived in Mesa, Arizona, while Arias was living with her family in Wairica, California. Along with their phone and email communications, they also went on work-related trips together. Arias became obsessed with Travis very quickly. Travis was a Mormon, and within two months, Arius was being baptized into the Mormon religion. She even admitted that the baptism was a way to get closer to Travis. Their relationship didn't become exclusive until February of 2007, and continued as a long-distance relationship. Their official relationship was short-lived, though, as they broke up that following June, which was the same time that Arius moved to Mesa. I actually moved to Mesa a few weeks after we broke up. Really? Mm -hmm. okay. I mean, as far as the timeline goes, but I mean, if you want to call it our official breakup, shortly thereafter, it's like we were still seeing each other. And you guys were seeing each other, but it was a long distance type relationship. It was always long distance when we were officially dating. We didn't re date We dated from about the beginning of February to about the end of June. So okay. February, March, April, May, June, about five months total. Okay. In June of 2007, you guys broke up and... 
And then you moved to Mesa. Um, yeah, I moved to Mesa, sort of. Most people, when they break up, they kind of go their own way. I know, and it was, and we, plans were already in order for me to move there. Um, I was already speaking with a friend who was, you know, was going to be her roommate, and I was her roommate for a short time. Mm -hmm. Um, she's kind of flighty. She's a great girl, though. Um, I had talked to Travis about maybe going to Southern California instead. Okay. And he's really, he's, he's really persuasive. It persuaded you to stay there in Mesa? He's, he kind of was playing up all the advantages if I did come to Mesa. Mm -hmm. And if I did, you know, um, he said, you know, it's, it's, it's a great place. We could still see each other and hang out on occasion. Um, the church is very strong. You know, you'll, you'll make a lot of friends. And I already knew all this stuff prior because I we talked about that. Um, you know, and so I went ahead and just made the move. It sounded at the time like a good idea. According to Arius, she had already been planning to move when they broke up. They continued having a sexual relationship off and on up until Travis Alexander's death. During the time that Arius was living in Mesa, Travis's friends started to express that they thought she was creepy. Her life revolved around Travis, and she never talked about her past. Even when Travis started dating another woman, he and Arius would still travel together and send each other sexually explicit messages. Travis complained to his friends that she was stalking him, threatening his new girlfriend, and that she slashed his tires twice. He also claimed that she snuck into his house through a dog door at night while he was sleeping. Eventually, Arius's roommate got married, so she moved back to Wairika to live with her grandparents. Records show that the two still exchanged sexual messages and photos in the months after she moved back to California. In June of 2008, Travis suspected that Arius had hacked into his Facebook account and his bank account. At this point, he told her that he no longer wanted any contact from her. She was supposed to go on a work-related trip to Cancun, Mexico with him later that month, but he decided to go with another girl just as friends. After not being seen in days and missing an important meeting, Travis's friends grew concerned. On June 9, 2008, they went to his home where they found his bloody body laying in the shower. They called 911. What's going on? Um, a friend of ours is dead in his bedroom. We, we hadn't heard from him for a while. We think he's dead. His roommate just went in there and, and said there's lots of blood. I didn't go in, but I, I can give you the phone to someone who went in there. Can, yes, please, can you? Hello. Hi, so what's going on? He's, uh, he, he's dead. He's in his bedroom okay. in, in the shower. Okay. How did this happen? Do you have any idea? No, we have no idea. Everyone's been wondering about him okay. for well, a few said, days. Well, she said that there was blood. So is it coming from his head? Did he cut no, his head? No, it, 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 it's all over the place. Is there any weapons around? I No, I don't know. I Not that I saw. How many people are in the house? There are, how, how, many of us, how many are in the house right now? Just the five of us? Five of us. Okay, I need... All of you outside. Okay. Hold on just a moment. Okay. You're a good friend of, of Travis's, correct? Right? Yes, I am. Okay. Yeah. Has he been depressed at all, thinking about yeah. committing suicide, anything like that? I, I don't think he's been thinking committing suicide. He's been really depressed because he uh, broke up with this girl, and he was all upset about that. But I, I don't think he would actually kill himself over that. The girl they mentioned that he had just broken up with was a woman he dated after Arius. Of course, when the operator asks if anyone had been threatening Travis, Arius was immediately mentioned. Has he been threatened by anyone recently? Yes, he has. Okay. He, has a, he has an ex-girlfriend that's been bothering him and, and um, following him and slashing tires and things like that. And do you know the ex-girlfriend's name? Um, um, do you remember it? What's his what ex-girlfriend's name? Ask Taylor. What's that? And do you know if he's ever reported it to the police? Um, her, his, her name is Jody. Um, I don't know if he's ever reported. Hold on. Yeah. Ask Taylor if he's ever reported Jody to the police. Like, if Travis did. No, he hasn't reported anything about Jody's behavior. 
The operator talks to multiple people at the scene. Another one of Travis's friends describes what was found in the house. Um, I didn't go in, but from what I heard, his roommate went in. There's blood in his bedroom mm -hmm. behind the door, uh, and, probably, and then he said it's all over. And then they went in the bathroom, and he's in his shower. Okay. So and the, his, his, um, his bedroom is where in the house? It's upstairs. Um, and if you go up the stairs, it's on the left. It's the first door on your left. It's the only door on your left. Okay. And, um, and it's just a big master suite bedroom up there. And, um, she's talking to his friend right now. Um, there's a girl that's been stalking him, um, and things, mm -hmm. and she's trying, and he's trying to, uh, you might know some information. I hope my phone doesn't die. I'm on like one bar of battery. So. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm just going to keep you on the phone until officers arrive, either officers or paramedics arrive, okay? Okay, I think I can hear the sound. Mm -hmm. yeah. Travis had been stabbed 27 times, shot in the head, and his throat was slashed from ear to ear. The Maricopa County Medical Examiner testified that Travis's jugular vein, common carotid artery, and windpipe had all been cut. Rephrased. Which one? Which one would have been first, in your opinion? Well, the stab wound could have occurred, and then the defensive injuries could have happened after the after the wound of the chest occurred. Right. Okay. And then, in terms of the sequence of the injuries involving the three major ones that we talked about, what is your opinion? Well, the throat injuries and/or the head wound are going to be immediately incapacitating, and he's not going to attempt to defend himself after that. Okay. Uh, in terms of the shot to the head, do you have any opinion as to whether or not he was alive at the time that that shot was struck? I can't say. Do you have an opinion as to the wound to the neck, whether or not he was alive at the time that that was uh, rendered, if you will? I believe he was. There's a great deal of hemorrhage associated with that. And was he alive with regard to the one to the chest that we've been talking about? Yes, I believe he was. Can you tell with regard to the gunshot wound to the right temple whether or not he was alive or not at that point? Uh, again, there's a wound going through the head, and I don't see hemorrhage in the brain. I can't see a wound track through the brain, so all I know is that there's a bullet going through the brain, so I can't say with certainty. And if we don't see hemorrhaging or bleeding, as you talked about, is that an indication that the person was already dead. They may have been, yes. He said that it was possible that Travis was dead at the time of the gunshot wound to the head. On May 28, 2008, Arius's grandparents had a burglary at their home in Wairika, California, where a 25 caliber handgun was one of the items stolen. Travis had been shot with a 25 caliber round, and one spent casing was recovered from the bathroom floor near one of the sinks in the master bathroom. Prosecutors argued that the burglary was staged by Arius so she could steal the gun, but have a reason why it was missing from her grandparents' house. On June 2, 2008, Arius rented a white Ford Focus from a budget rent-a-car in Redding, California. She told the clerk that she would only be driving the car locally, but when she returned the car, she had driven 2,800 miles, or about 4,500 kilometers. The car was also missing all of its floor mats and had what budget employees said looked like Kool-Aid stains on the carpet. Unfortunately, the company had the car detailed before the police were able to examine it. In her first interrogation, she describes her version of the trip she took during the time Travis was killed. Um, instead of going over to Utah, you went straight out to Los Angeles area. I went to Santa Cruz first. Santa Cruz. Mm -hmm. okay. And then I stayed the night in Monterey. And the next day I drove to <clears throat> Pasadena, okay. waiting for Laura to call me back. You didn't contact her at all? Uh, she contacted me finally after I'd already left LA. It was too late. You'd already yeah. left at that point. Yeah, and we had plans to, to do that again this and week. Which route did you take from, from there? I was supposed to get on the 15 and go all the way up. Uh -huh. And I somehow got off the 15. Where did you end up? Um, for a while I was lost. And I'm not above sleeping in the car, so I slept for a while. Okay. I'm a heavy sleeper and I sleep a lot, so... But you were on the 15 for a while mm -hmm. and you ended up getting off the 15 somewhere? Yeah, I, I, I looked at a map and I'm pretty sure I know where I went. I went... Can I draw you a map? Sure. Because I eventually started seeing signs 
um, for Phoenix. And I was like, and it was several hundred miles away still. But like, that's weird. Where am I going? Um, so you have California, Los Angeles, and um, Nevada, Arizona, Utah. And I was supposed to go somewhere right up here. Oh, I'm a lefty. So the 15 kind of does one of these. Yeah. Goes um, through, let's say, Las Vegas right here. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, my no, that's okay. So that's wrong. okay. So we'll just put, just put I just, I know it cuts it. through Arizona in the corner. Um, Las Vegas, um, St. George is somewhere here. And then the 40 runs somewhere this way because somehow I, I ended up on the 40. And when I saw the 40, I'm like, the only thing I associate with the 40 is Flagstaff, and Flagstaff is somewhere yeah, in North Flagstaff Utah, right up here. I mean, north, north, Northern Arizona. And so, um, and it was, I was going east, and I was like, this isn't, this, what's going on here? I just, I wasn't going the right way, and so I... So you, you took this trip, and you left on, was it Monday the 2nd, right? And you didn't get to Utah until Thursday, you told me. Yeah, I got to Utah on Thursday. So Thursday, and that's the... I've gone over this trip over and over in my mind and on paper. And even if there's still 20 some odd hours, even if you pulled over to sleep, a couple of times. Oh, did I tell you that I got stranded? Yeah. Okay. You mentioned that. If you slept for 10 hours. I only slept for Here hour. and here, it would still leave 18 some odd hours. She claimed that she visited friends in Pasadena, California, before driving to Salt Lake City, Utah, to visit friends there. Friends testified that they did see her in Pasadena and in Salt Lake City. That trip would have only racked up about 1,800 to 1,900 miles. Add a few hundred miles of driving around each day, and that's only 2,100 miles. If you chart a trip going to Pasadena, Mesa, Salt Lake City, and then back to Redding, the number is much closer. Also, on June 4th, records show that Arius made a phone call that placed her about 45 miles, or about 72 kilometers north of Kingman, Arizona. This is because she had a business meeting in Mesquite, Nevada on June 5th. She was stopped by a patrol officer later that same day near Salt Lake City because her license plate was upside down, something she chalked up to a teen prank. If you factor in that detour with a few hundred miles of driving around each day, you get a number that's much closer to the 2,800 miles or 4,500 kilometers that the rental company said she drove. Days before her trip began, Arius called her ex-boyfriend who lived in Pasadena and asked if she could borrow two five-gallon fuel cans. These two cans, and one more she purchased, were used to fill the rented car with gas while she was driving to and from Mesa, Arizona, so there were no records of her getting gas around Travis's home. Her phone was conveniently turned off from outside of Los Angeles until she made the phone call that showed she was just north of Kingman, Arizona. If she was going from Pasadena to Mesquite, Nevada, she would have no reason to be in Arizona. She claimed that she got lost and ended up going through Arizona, but that was a huge detour and it would have been very hard to accidentally go through Arizona. The most damning pieces of evidence included a digital camera that investigators found in the washing machine of Travis's home. Photos recovered from the memory card were time-stamped with the date June 4, 2008, and showed both Arius and Travis naked and engaging in various sexual acts. One of the pictures showed Travis taking a shower in the same shower where he was found dead. Two other pictures looked as though the camera was dropped and captured pictures of Travis covered in blood with Arius's leg in the shot. After stabbing Travis, slashing his throat, and shooting him in the head, she dragged his body into the shower and headed to Nevada for her conference. When she arrived in Salt Lake City, her friends said that she had a bandage on her hand and she wore long sleeves the whole time she was there, even though it was the middle of summer. She was arrested in Wairica, California, and a detective from Arizona traveled up there to interview her. During the first day of interrogations, she stood firm on her claim that she had not gone to see Travis and had nothing to do with his death. I did not go near his house. Isn't there 
Aren't there? I pulled your cell records. Your cell phone was turned off between here and here. Okay. But the last place it pulled it was here. The next place it turned on was here. What does that show me? Oh, well, I began. Oh, no, no, no. Is there plenty of time for you to do that? Yes. And I do I believe that you had come to visit Travis? Yes. I truly believe it. Did you have the opportunity? Yes. You were traveling alone. There's no other witnesses. Your phone just happened to turn off from here to here. Well, I didn't turn it off physically, but it died. And then it magically you, I got you it found back. your charger here? It was I was under the packed under the seat of the passenger side. And it was when I was When you were lost, you couldn't have maybe pulled over and found it or Well, I did finally start looking when I was stranded. I wouldn't I wouldn't have pulled over when I was lost. Okay, this I've been focusing on this and going over and over my mind why this happened. Why your phone turns off here outside of Los Angeles. What city is that? Because I got towards, as far as um so cities, there's towers. Oh okay. Well okay, I got there's towers dotted all over this place. Yeah. One tower hit here, the other tower here on the ninety three. There is no way somebody can get on that 15 and magically get on that 93. Because that 15 goes right through Las Vegas, right there, and continues this way. It well, never goes through Arizona again. I, I got off before Las Vegas. Okay. I didn't get the, back on. The 15, you'd have to go to Las Vegas and then come down south, go through one of the Boulder City. I went um, through Boulder City going north. Did you cross over the, uh, the dam? Uh -huh. You didn't think that was odd? You were crossing it over Arizona? Well, after I, fig I figured out it was lost by then, and I found, okay. I found the 93 and then found my way back to the 15. And this tower here, it's not just over the border in Arizona. It's quite a distance inside of Arizona that it hit. Because there is a mountain range all along here. And if you're on this side of the mountain range, pretty good distance, that signal's not going to come, not going to hit you to power Utah uh, or Nevada or California. It's only going to hit in Arizona. The detective laid out the evidence against her, the mileage on the car, the pictures of her at his house, the bloody handprint. At one point, she asks if Travis's family knew they were still having a sexual relationship, and she said it was because she wanted to protect how Travis was remembered. A few hours into the interrogation, she claims that she had no motive to kill Travis because he had never done anything but help her. But back there in that mind of yours is somebody screaming to get out and tell me what happened, but you just cannot. <sighs> he has done nothing but, I mean, except for some mean words that he said. People have said worse to me or just as bad. Except for that, he's never, he's helped me, he's given me money, he was selling me his car on the then why? easiest, then why, lamest Joey, terms why? ever. There's no reason why. There was no reason why. That statement is important to remember for when she tries to claim that Travis was abusive during her trial. The one strange thing about this interrogation is the length at which she gives answers. I feel like any person who's not involved in a crime would give much more concise answers. The detective says it looked like Travis thought the relationship was unhealthy and asks if she agreed. I would answer, sure, and then maybe sum up a little bit why I thought that. She goes into extreme detail and constantly adds information that wasn't necessary to answer the question. What the extra info always does seem to do, though, is subtly explain questions that people might have about her involvement in Travis's death. She's trying to eliminate questions before they're even asked. He felt that the relationship between you and him was somewhat unhealthy, but he couldn't stop it. And I assume that's probably maybe the same way you felt about him, or it's probably, maybe you didn't understand why he didn't believe it was healthy. No, I, I didn't think it was healthy either, spiritually at least, and probably emotionally but mostly spiritually, and I think that kind of, once you have something that's not healthy spiritually, it filters through all aspects of your life. Um, 
I just, things were not working. Everything in Arizona was like, except for the wonderful friends that I made in my ward um, and the opportunity. It's like the Mormon land of opportunity there, which is awesome. But except for all that, like every sign was pointing, just, just go, you know. I lived five minutes away, 10, maybe 10, depending. And it was just too convenient and too easy. And it was fun and we had fun when we were together. And so yeah, I moved away. Um, shortly after high school and I come back to visit but I realize over the years I've missed out on a lot of things with my little brother and sister I missed out on just uh, their karate or their baseball I owe my parents a lot of money and I owe my grandparents a lot of money and I owe friends money I owe I know that he really liked Mimi and he said he did Arius spends hours trying to come up with far-fetched ideas on why her blood hair and handprint were in Travis's home she tried to suggest that the pictures came from the memory card that was in an old camera, even though the pictures were time-stamped and show Travis covered in blood in at least one photo. She brings the conversation back to her and Travis's relationship at any point she can, though. It's almost like she thinks she's in a counseling session instead of an interrogation. At one point, when the detective asks her if she's ever had any anger issues, she starts telling him about a time when she kicked her family's dog. I kicked a dog once. I was a freshman in high school, and I love, love, love animals. And one, we had this dog, his name was Doggy Boy, and my parents, until this dog that they have now, have never been able to, and I don't mean just them, we as a family have never been able to care for a dog properly as far as give it attention and take it for walks and be consistent. Um, so this dog stayed in the backyard a lot, and he stayed tied up on, you know, in the shade with plenty of, you know, leeway. At one point, though, he was untied, and I took the trash out, and he, and this is when my little brother and sister were still in diapers, and he tore this, it was a diaper trash, and he tore diapers all over the yard. And of course, I had to clean it up, and when diapers get wet, and they're like this jelly, spongy, weird stuff, and... I just, I got mad and I, I just kicked him with my right foot and he just moved a few feet and he didn't yelp or anything, but he just went, he ran away and I never saw him again after that. And I mean, that's probably an anger issue, I guess. But well, one time kicking a dog is kind of an anger issue. It changed my world as far as animal treatment goes because I just, I've never seen him since. Once the detective starts explaining to her that she's going to be placed under arrest and booked into the local jail, she asks if it's possible that she can fix herself up before she gets booked. How long is it all going to take you to do your paperwork? I don't know. Paperwork? I don't know. I need to go see. The procedures are different here in California than they are in Arizona. I'm used to the procedures in Arizona. So I'm getting help from this county and the deputies here, and they're assisting me. So I need to get with them and find out how long it's going to take. Um, this is a really trivial question, and it's going to reveal how shallow I am. <laughs> but before they book me, can I clean myself up a little bit? You're going to be taken the way you are. I can't give you anything else. How soon? I don't know. Like five minutes, two hours. I would say within an hour. Because you wouldn't want to take an unflattering mugshot after you get caught killing your ex-boyfriend. After Detective Flores steps out is when things start getting even weirder. At one point, she starts talking to herself, saying, quote, You should have at least done your makeup, Jody. Gosh. End quote. Then she starts singing the song, Here With Me, by Dido. You should have at least done your makeup, Jody. Gosh. I didn't hear you breathe. I wonder how am I still here, and I won't go, and I can't breathe until you're resting here with me, and I won't go, and I can't hide. She scoots her chair over to make room so she can do a headstand. She looks through a garbage can and shuffles through some papers on a table. Then she starts singing Oh Holy Night, stopping at one point to giggle to herself before continuing with the hymn.
the stars are brightly shining. This is the day of our dear Savior's birth. <laughs> In the angel voices I know that everyone responds differently to stress in extreme situations, but it just doesn't feel like the actions of an innocent woman who was just told she was going to get booked into jail on a $2 million bond extradited to Arizona and put on trial for premeditated murder. The interview continues the following day, with Arius in an orange outfit from the jail. This time, Arius is being interviewed by a woman, and she's noticeably less talkative. I believe that she's very good at manipulating men, and she knows that, so she's less apt to offer more information to a woman. Arius seems more concerned with what will happen to the cash and belongings she had on her when she was taken into custody. It's almost like she's completely detached from the real situation and can only think about what's going on with her. She tells the detective that she took wedding photos and that the memory card in her camera still has them on it. She even starts crying about how these were the only photos of their wedding and how important it was that they get them. Can I ask you a couple questions? Sure. Um, not personal questions. Um, I know I understand they took some of my stuff yesterday. Mm -hmm. Where does all that go? Go to Arizona? Um, it'll, it'll be transferred to Arizona. It's held in evidence. There's a list of everything that was taken, and, and um, a copy of that was left at each, um, location. At each location. And it was a carbon copy, so my parents couldn't read it all. My grandparents couldn't read everything. They um, told me some of the things, and some of the things were like my camera, for example, mm -hmm. which is fine. I understand that. My concern is other people. Um, for example, I'm a wedding photographer, and I just did a wedding on Friday, and um, feel bad for Brian and his wife Katie because those are their wedding pictures. It's all they have for their wedding. And I just want to know when they'll be able to get their wedding pictures. I don't know when. I don't know how, you know, th this could go on for That's quite a while. That's the only thing they have to remember the day. They're you not going to destroy the wedding pictures. They're not going to get rid of them or anything like that. You know, and I, I just take pride in my work, and I guess, you know, I'm not going to have a chance to edit them and make them really beautiful. Like, they already turned out really good, but, you know, with Photoshop, I just do all kinds of neat effects, and they just, they turn out like magic. And so, it, that won't be the case this time, but at least the, the hard, hard files are there for them. And, you know, if they're not going to get them forever and ever, it's going to suck for them, but as long as they get them eventually. They'll get them eventually. Eventually, the detective tells her to forget about her stuff and start talking about the serious crime that she's been arrested for. You know, I think you're not grasping the reality of this situation. Um, and hearing, you know, what your concerns are, you should be concerned for yourself right now. You should be fighting for yourself. While talking to this detective, I believe it's the point where she realizes that she needs to come up with another story. She started asking if she could see the crime scene photos. The detective asks why she wants to see them, and she gives her vague answers about helping with closure, but she's very insistent on seeing them. This detective doesn't let her see the photos, and eventually Detective Flores comes in and takes over the interrogation. He tells her that he can't show her the crime scene photos, and she practically begs to see any of the photos. Richard said something about uh, you wanting to see some photos, but I, I don't think I can show you any, any more photos. Why not? not just. Uh, I don't like doing that because something might happen to you. You, you might. Uh, first off, it, it's not something I do. The reason I asked was because of. I just feel like it might help me piece some things together. Um, and. Uh, this is a more of a selfish reason. I think it might give me some sense of closure. I know it's kind of morbid. I don't even think I really deserve closure. What is it you want to know about the photos? Do you want to see the room? Do you want to see the bathroom? Or do you want to see him? Or is it the photos before it happened that you want to see? I think the photos of after everything. 
I, I won't show you those. I, I won't. I'm not in good conscience. I, I, I can't do that. Are there, is there any that you can? No. I can't do that. What about photos of just the room with him not in it? I don't know. Maybe it's I don't have them with me here, but... I believe there's a good reason why she wants to see any crime scene photos that she can. It's because she's now working on coming up with a new story, and she wants to make sure the new story matches the crime scene. He never lets her see the photos, so she has to take the leap and change her story. For the first time. She eventually admits to going to Travis's house, where they had sex and took pictures. This time, though, she claimed that two masked individuals, one male, one female, came into the house and killed Travis. He was kneeling down in the shower. I don't remember him. If, he, like, if this is his shower and the sink is over here, I was like right here taking pictures. And I don't really know what happened after that exactly, except I think he was shot. Where were you? Um, if this is his shower and he's sitting here, I was like, well, if this is his shower and he's sitting here, I was like right here on my knees in his bathtub was right here and I was taking him here and I was just going through the pictures and I heard this loud ring. And I don't really remember except Travis was screaming. I think I got knocked out, but I don't think it was that long. Um, I know I got knocked in the head, and I've, I've gotten knocked in the head once by my dad when he was just really mad, and it wasn't like, actually it wasn't, he didn't knock me in the head, he just pushed me against the wall, and I hit my head, and I fell. But he, in this case, I think it was similar, because he uh, was screaming, and I was by the bathtub. And he was holding his head, and there were two people there, and what did you say? Um, I remember putting my hand on his back because he was on his all four of his knees. He was like on his knees like this, doing something like this or something like I don't know, and I was like. I was like, are you okay? What's going on? What's going on? He's like, go get help. Go get help. And I said, okay. And I turned around. There were two people there. One was a guy and one was a girl. I, I could, couldn't tell that at first, but I could just see one was a girl. And I assumed the other was a guy because their build and then their voices. She put on a big show explaining that, even though these two people stabbed Travis 27 times, slashed his throat, and shot him in the head, they let her live for some odd reason. You ever, ever, ever say anything about this? That they'll do to my family the same way and me and I didn't care so much about me at that point he said you need to leave and don't you call anybody and don't you say anything and don't you act like anything happened he's all I'm giving you one chance She said she's going to rat us off. She's going to say something. And he was like, shut up. He was like, you get one chance. Is that when you left? I said, leave now. And part of me didn't want to leave. Travis wasn't, was still alive. He was still... I could, he wasn't moving a lot, but he was still alive. I could see that he was still. Did you leave at that point? Um, I left the room. And, and where did you go? 
I went downstairs, but I didn't have all my clothes. What did you leave there? Well, Travis said I had some stuff there. I didn't see what it was. He said it was in his closet. So they were clothes of mine. But all I had was my purse and my backpack. I left with those and and I went outside. Mm -hmm. And then what you do? I just wanted to get help. He told me that if I didn't say anything, that I would be, that I would, that I wouldn't even live to regret it, but that I would regret it. She claimed that the female wanted to kill her, but the male said, quote, no, that's not what we're here for, end quote, and they left. She said that they took her purse so that they had her information, and she was scared that they would come for her and her family if she told anyone about them. I don't know who they are. They know where I live. Mm -hmm. Or they know where my parents are. I don't know if they know where my grandparents are, but they got my address, and they know where my family is. Mm -hmm. Sorry. So you're trying to say you're doing this to protect your family? Why would someone do this to you and to him? I don't think they really intended to do anything to me. You're saying somebody followed you all the way to Arizona from here? No, I don't think, I think I was an element of surprise for them. You were an element of surprise? So they didn't expect I'm you guessing. to be there? I don't think so. They didn't expect you to be there? I mean, they had to see my car. Is it someone who lives in Mesa Local? I didn't recognize any of them. Well, you have to give me a motive. Why would they do this? Were they going after Travis? For what reason? You tell me this, but you give me no reason. They didn't discuss much. They just argued. About what? About whether or not to kill me. For what reason? Because I'm a witness. A witness of what? Him. Of Travis. Of Travis's murder. Yeah, but I didn't really witness it. Didn't see much. Because... Okay. I just, um... Oh. You need to make this believable, because it is not believable to me right now. The detective clearly doesn't believe the story. I was really freaked out of my mind. Okay. I don't believe you. When I came in here hoping that you would tell me the truth. And this is not the truth, Jody. This is all I know. This just does not make any sense. It does not make any sense. That's all I know. Nothing changes for me. I didn't think it would. I feel responsible because I feel that I could have done more. I feel that I should have gotten help. I feel that I should have been stronger. You feel responsible because you did this. I did not Joni, kill Travis. you did. You did. And there's nothing you can say that'll change my mind at this point. This is an elaborate story which does not make any sense. Two people come in, carry out a brutal, bloody murder, and then actively leave the only witness alive? No. Jody Arias was extradited to Arizona, where she stood trial for first-degree premeditated murder. Then her story changed again. She pleaded not guilty to the charges and claimed that she did kill Travis, but it was in self-defense. 
She claimed that he was abusive. Remember in the interrogation when she repeatedly claimed to have no reason to kill Travis because he was so good to her? Yeah, me too. She didn't stop there, though, because she also claimed that he was a pedophile. Due to Arius' narcissism, she believed she could talk her way out of anything, so she decided that she was going to represent herself at trial, and her request was initially granted. She was required to still have her public defenders present, but she would be able to run the show. She admitted letters into evidence that she claimed were from Travis explaining his sexual desires toward children. Now, these letters came to the defense on April 11, 2010, in the form of emails from someone named Bob White. The letters were sent by him, and all he wrote in the email was, quote, I came across these, but don't want to be involved, end quote. Bob White was never identified, and the location of the original letters was never disclosed. After being inspected, the letters were determined to be forgeries, and the contents of the letters were sealed on July 15, 2010. There was no other indication that Travis Alexander was either abusive or a pedophile. Not a single other person interviewed recalled him ever being violent. Arius's own journals contained no instance where she ever wrote about being abused by Travis. A search of his computer found no evidence of pedophilia. On top of that, it was pretty clear that she had planned her trip with murder in mind. She stole her grandparents' gun and brought it with her to Travis's house. She used a rental car to drive to Travis's house so his neighbors wouldn't recognize her car. She brought three five-gallon canisters of gas with her so she could fill the car's tank on her way to and from Mesa and not have a record of getting gas. She turned her cell phone off in the area around Mesa so there wouldn't be a record of her in the area. She clearly planned to go to Mesa, kill Travis, and then claim she was never in the area. Due to her attempt to get fraudulent letters admitted as evidence, the judge reinstated her defense counsel. She testified in her own defense, which took 18 days, an amount of time other lawyers said was unprecedented. I'm not surprised, though, as Arius believes she can talk her way out of anything, and honestly, even though it's for a murder trial where she's the defendant, she just simply needs the attention. The first thing Arius did on the stand was admit that she did kill Travis, but that it was in self-defense. According to her, she was taking pictures of Travis while he was in the shower, and when she accidentally dropped his new camera, he became enraged and attacked her. So, in self-defense, she stabbed him 27 times, slit his throat, and shot him in the head. But where was the knife? Was there a knife already in the bathroom? It seems unlikely. So, while he was attacking her, she left and got a knife from the kitchen, and then went back to the bathroom? And where did the gun come from? She stole her grandparents' gun a week prior and brought it with her to Travis's house. And he coincidentally attacked her, so she used it? And why was the gun readily available? Why did she have the gun on her and close enough to use while they were in the bathroom? It makes no sense. Her lawyer immediately plays damage control regarding an interview she did with Inside Edition before her trial started. Let me ask you a couple of important questions before we get back and start talking about who you are and why you're here, okay? Okay. Did you kill Travis Alexander on June 4th, 2008? Yes, I did. Why? Um, the simple answer is that he attacked me and okay. I defended myself. Okay. It was also brought up during this, these proceedings that you gave a interview with Inside Edition. Do you remember seeing that tape? Yes, I do. And in that tape, you said that no jury would convict you, something to that effect. Do you remember seeing that? Remember saying that? Yeah, I did say that. Why? Um, I made that statement in September 2008, I believe it was. And um, at the time, I had plans to commit suicide. Um, so I was extremely confident that no jury would convict me because I didn't expect any of you to be here. I didn't expect to be here. 
So I could have easily said no jury would acquit me either. I couldn't say that, though, because there was an officer sitting five feet behind me, and had I told them the reason no jury would convict me at that time, I would have been thrown into a padded cell and stripped down, and that would have been my life for a while until I stabilized. Um, so I was very confident that no jury would convict me because I planned to be dead. She claims that she was going to kill herself, and that was why she was so sure that she wouldn't be convicted. Because she would be dead. But let's take a look at that interview. Did you kill Travis Alexander? I absolutely did not kill Travis Alexander. I had nothing to do with his murder. I didn't harm him in any way. She seems pretty adamant that she didn't kill Travis. No jury is going to convict me. Why not? Because I'm innocent, and you can mark my words on that one. No jury will convict me. This is supposed to be her claiming that she won't get convicted because she's planning suicide, even though in the interview she says directly, quote, because I'm innocent, end quote. Taking the stand was not a good decision because it hurt her in the long run. Once she's cross-examined by the prosecutor, she tries to twist all of her answers, but it just makes her look bad. You never went in, yes or no? I said no. And when you went and looked, you saw something that upset you, right? Yes. You saw Mr. Alexander, right? I didn't know it was him at first, yes but no. yes. Did you see him me. during that encounter? Yes, you see him. I did, I said no. Pardon? I didn't know it was him at first. You didn't see him when you were there that night? I did afterward, yes. That night, ma'am, listen to my question. That night, did you see Mr. Alexander inside that house? Yes or no? Yes. Yes or no? Were you able to see her face or not? Part of it was shadowed from the yes, TV no, behind her, so I saw part of it. Judge, she's not answering my question for the instructor. Ms. Arias, listen carefully to the question and answer only the question you were asked. Okay. You may continue. Could you see her face? Yes or no? Part of it. What happened then is you actually were watching what they were doing then, right? Briefly, yes. Did I ask you for how long, ma'am? No. I asked you if you stood there and watched them, right? No. You, you didn't stand there and watch them? I didn't stand there. I saw it, and then I turned and ran out of the so backyard. You, but you saw enough to know that they were kissing, right? Um, yes. You used the term making out, didn't you, yesterday? Yes. And there were, the lights weren't on, right? There was a light. Well, didn't you indicate that it was like a TV kind of light? That so? light, yes. Right? So there was no light. There was a television that was on, right? That's light. Ma'am. Was it a light or was it a television that was on? It was light from a television screen. So, are you saying that it was a television that was on then? Yes. She really doesn't want to give straight answers. It's a manipulative tool that people use so that they have an easier time changing or adjusting their story later on. If she's on record simply saying yes or no, she can't deny what she meant later. The prosecutor picks apart her claims of being abused by Travis and of him being a pedophile, pointing out that they only conveniently surfaced after she claimed she killed him in self-defense. That was a significant day, January 22nd of 2008, correct? Yes. It was significant for a number of reasons, including the fact that you claimed that on January 21 of 2008, you caught Mr. Alexander masturbating uh, to some images of boys, correct? I only saw one image. It was a boy. Ma'am, didn't you say that there were images? There were more than one? There were more than one image. I only caught a so clue. So was there more one than image. one image? I'm sorry. Was there more than one image, ma'am? Yes. Okay, but you only saw one, right? One clearly, According to yes. you. Mm -hmm. Is that yes? That's yes. And that was the day before this supposed thing happened on January, or where he had this violent issue with you on January 22nd of 2008, right? That's right. And if we go again to this entry here at 456, I haven't written because there has, there has been nothing noteworthy to report. That's what you wrote, correct? Correct. The way you explain it to us here, this issue involving Mr. Al this claimed issue involving Mr. Alexander, that's pretty noteworthy, isn't it? Not for my journal, but it, is it noteworthy? Yes, in reality, I guess it is very noteworthy. It's noteworthy to you, isn't it? It is today. 
It's noteworthy to you, isn't it? I already answered your question. And the answer is yes or no? Yes. And it's so noteworthy to you that you waited until after you killed Mr. Alexander to tell anybody about it, right? I waited years. The answer is, did you wait until after this prosecution started, after you were charged, to tell anybody about it, correct? I should ask an answer. Oh, world. Yes, I waited years. And ma'am, one of the things that the way you made it sound was that he had a problem, right? He did have a problem. That's what you claim, right? That's the reality. That's what you claim, correct? Okay, yes. When back then there was this problem, did you call, for example, child, the way you made it sound is he had this huge problem. Did you call, for example, Child Protective Service? No. I mean, you made it sound that there was such a big problem that he even went and spent the night somewhere at a friend's house and they had a child, and that concerned you. Do you remember telling us that on direct examination? Yes. And yet, you didn't go to that person and tell him, hey, he's got this issue, did you? No. You didn't go to the police department and tell him anything, right? No. You chose to keep that allegation until about a, two years ago, is that right? Um, I think it's almost three years ago at this point. No. I think it was almost three and a half, four years ago at this point. Pick a year. What year did you disclose? 2009 was when I first and told somebody. And you were arrested back in July of 2008, right? Yes. And when this detective interviewed you, you didn't tell him anything about it, did you? Definitely not. And you could have, though, right? In theory, yes, I could have. It's really sad that she's willing to portray Travis as a pedophile in order to try to save herself from prison. It shows just how far she'll go to protect herself at the expense of others. On May 7, 2013, Jody Arias was found guilty of first-degree murder. In the following aggravation phase of the trial, Arias was found to be eligible for the death penalty. There were two mistrials during the sentencing phase with jurors not being able to come to an agreement on whether or not to sentence her to death. The judge ultimately sentenced her to life without the possibility of parole. In 2019, Arias' lawyers filed an appeal to have her conviction thrown out, citing misconduct from the prosecuting attorney. On March 24, 2020, the Arizona Court of Appeals upheld Jody Arias' first-degree murder conviction. She will never be released from prison. Thanks so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, give us a thumbs up, leave us a comment, and make sure to hit the subscribe button to ensure you don't miss a video. Also, remember that if you'd like to support the show, you can find information on how to do that in the video's info or at thisismonsters.com forward slash support. Thanks again.